So we're talking about uh, three of the very cool new things uh, within the Nick Collection 3 today. We're starting off in Photoshop, and then we're going to move over into Adobe Lightroom, and we'll talk about the new non-destructive process that you can use from the Lightroom interface, Lightroom Classic, that is. Uh, first thing we should do, though, is talk about the new Nick Selective tool. So, it, you know, some might say, well, whatever, it's a new way of getting to the, to the software, but it's actually a really handy new interface uh, that gives us access to some cool different things. Um, first of all, the other Nick Selective tool, the old version of the Nick Selective tool was just a, a different, older looking interface um, that, that didn't match the Photoshop interface so well. And um, there's a few cool features just in how you can interact with it. Right now, I've got it all the way open so that you can see um, the, the different Nick plugins as they are listed out um, in basically the order that you might use them in a workflow. Uh, I can minimize this as well. And then when you minimize it, you'll actually notice that this thing will shoot down into the lower left corner. So it's still accessible down here. And hopefully you can see that. Um, and I can just go ahead and click on it and open that back up without closing the thing. So that's really quite nice. If you do want to close this, this interface, you, you absolutely can. You can still access the Nick plugins through the filter drop-down menu and the Nick collection. Um, but this is a really handy new feature. Uh, that's slightly different. And in fact, let's let's talk about one of these main differences. So there's a little drop down menu next to a couple of these different plugins. Color effects, you'll see one for analog, silver effects, and sharpener pro three. Uh, to the right of the label itself. And this is going to open up into some different features. So for color effects pro four, um, you if you'd used the Nick Selective tool before, you know that you could access your individual filters and recipes. Uh, but now there's a new feature called Last Edit that's built right into the Nick Selective tool. I'm going to show you one of the ways of using that on a series of still life photographs where I might want to have a very consistent look across the board, and I might want to do that quickly and easily. So what we'll do is design a look for our series here. And then we'll basically be able to click on the last edit button and apply it over and over again. I'm also going to show you kind of two different ways of, of thinking about using it as well. So first things first, um, you can click on the individual filters if you know you want to enter into a specific one. Um, I, I might as well go ahead and click on the bleach bypass filter itself. We'll just open right up into color effects. Um, and what we're going to do here is create a you know a stack of filters that's going to process the image it's going to like look pretty nice i hope anyways oops you know what geez you know i went and set all of this up um earlier to to create a really cool presentation and apparently i didn't change my settings properly so what's happened here is i clicked on bleach bypass and the way that i've got the nick plugin set up it just applied the filter for me without even entering into the Nick plugin. So it's a cool feature to be able to do this. Actually didn't even mean to do that in this case. So what we're gonna do is move into the Nick collection selective tool. Follow me to the lower left corner where we've got this little gear. And we'll do this a couple times where I show you this portion of the interface. Um, but what's happening here is in the filters section uh, where it says apply favorite filters and recipes to last edit. If it's set to apply in Photoshop, it will literally just apply that filter or recipe without even opening the Nick plugin for us. So it's a much faster way of working. And if you've got a particular recipe or a way of using um, a bleach bypass or an individual filter, you don't even have to open up into the software. Basically, you can just click on the button and it applies it for you. I'll, I'll talk you through that one one more time. For now though, I wanna go back to apply in the Nick collection. So I'm gonna click on that. We're gonna click okay. I'm going to click on Bleach Bypass again within the Nick Selective tool, and this time the software should launch directly into uh, the, the filter that we've clicked on. Um, I'm going to click on the green button in the upper left corner, and that's going to expand our Color Effects Pro 4 interface out to full screen. For anyone who's not familiar with the, this interface, uh, Color Effects Pro 4 has a collection of 55 individual filters listed out on the left side. I clicked on Bleach Bypass, and basically what's going to happen is whatever the default settings for that particular filter are, we're going to open up into that. So if I click on the little checkbox to the left of our label, uh, you'll see a before and after of that particular filter. 
Now, we're not gonna get to explain every single filter in here, unfortunately, so I'm gonna kinda just go in and make some adjustments. We're gonna create what's called a filter stack um, that was gonna help to bring out some texture and direct your eye as the uh, viewer through the image. I like what this is doing now. We've kind of turned down the overall effect of the uh, bleach bypass filter. Uh, I'm gonna click add filter on the right side here, and this is just gonna button up the bleach bypass, and it allows us uh, to move over into our uh, filter list and open up a new filter. So in this case, uh, I think what I wanna do is the dark and light and center filter, and we'll just keep this really nice and simple for this um, aesthetic. And uh, what I definitely want to do is click the place center button, and I'm going to sort of place it a little closer to the center of our, um, I think this is part of a transmission, old rusty transmission. This is a photo series that my friend David Turner, um, who's a fashion photographer, uh, he's, he's given me some of these images to demo with. And um, what we're going to do here is use some control points to put the effect in where we want it to be. And we're gonna kind of remove the, the um, dark and light and center from the area where we don't want it to be. So I'll place a, a control point, plus control point in the lower left corner. I'll place another plus control point in the upper left corner. And again, now what we're doing is kind of just directing your attention um, in towards the uh, central area of the photograph where in this case, um, all of our image kind of exists or the direction where I want you to look. So. Let's say we love this effect. Um, I'm just gonna click the OK button in the lower right corner, and that's gonna apply the effect back in Photoshop. I did not save this stack, the Bleach Bypass and the uh, uh, Dark and Light and Center as a recipe, right? But I do have numerous other images that I want the exact same effect on. It would probably be a good idea to just save that as a recipe, um, you know, whether it's two filters or four or six or however many filters we wanted to use over and over again, it's probably best to just save it as a recipe. Sometimes you don't think to do that. Sometimes you want to work in a different process, in which case what we can do now is literally just click on the last edit button in the Nick Selective tool over here. And the way that we've got it set up is that the software is going to launch. Let's click on it. Color Effects Pro is gonna launch and it's gonna have our filter stack applied to it, in this case being Bleach Bypass and the um, Dark and Light and Center. And what's cool about this is that because we're using the last edit, the control points are actually saved into the image. In this case though, with Dark and Light and Center, I don't want the control points um, in the lower left and lower, I'm sorry, lower right corner and upper left corner. I want it in the lower left corner um, and we don't need this control point so I'll just go ahead and delete it so I'll click on it hit delete and we very quickly applied the exact same effect with bleach bypass and dark and light and center using the um, last state or last image uh, option right, and I'll show you that one more time so I'm going to click the OK button that's going to apply our uh, filter stack to our image and this is working as it always has before we've got our background layer and then our pixels are duplicated and we have a totally different set of pixels here in a layered fashion um, for non-destructive processes so we used the last edit button that time we're going to do that again except on the next image actually let's go to hinges let's go to this photograph um, instead of just clicking last edit opening up the software and letting it apply, you know, based upon those, those filters and us moving them around possibly or adjusting them. Uh, an even faster way to work in a separate way of doing this is to apply your last edit or your recipe or whatever options you're, you're trying to work with um, and filters you might be wanting to work with right inside of Photoshop. So follow me to the lower left corner of the Nick Selective tool we're gonna click on the settings button. And then now this time, we're going to go to apply favorite filters, this last setting in the general section. Um, and we're going to tell it to apply in Photoshop. So um, I, I tend to, in my own workflow, use apply in the Nick collection, because usually what I'm trying to do is go into um, the Nick Color Effects Pro 4 or Silver Effects or whichever piece of software we're using, and I'm gonna adapt to every single photo. But sometimes there's processes that you don't need to do that. So I'm gonna click last edit one more time. Watch what happens this time. We don't launch into the Nick software. We just apply the effect. 
But where this would work really well is if there's a particular recipe that you always use, a particular filter that you use in a particular way all of the time, and you don't want to spend time going into the NIC um, collection or the, the Color Effects Pro software or whatever. So it just applies it for you. You still have your layered process, and it's as quick and easy as it can be like that. Um, so the, the tools that have that last edit are actually Sharpener Pro, Silver Effects Pro, Analog Effects Pro, um, and uh, Define. I believe, and actually my interface is looking a little bit funky right now because I should have a couple more of these buttons, which is something that happens with my computer from time to time because I'm using um, all sorts of different versions of these pieces of software. Anyways, uh, that is the gist of the new Nick Selective tool. Um, I'll just minimize this for now because it cleans that up for us. Um, we could go into these other images and very quickly apply that same preset. Um, actually, you know, let's do one more thing. Now that I think of it, let's go back into the settings. I'm gonna say apply in the Nick collection, and I'm just gonna show you how to save this as a recipe. Uh, because if I were to close down uh, the software, and then open up other images and apply the Nick collection. Um, but I'd want, if I wanted that filter stack that we create in, in this set of images, I would wanna make sure that I save it as a recipe. And for people who aren't familiar, let's go ahead and take a look at how to do that. So I can still click on last edit. This is gonna launch the software. We'll have our filter stack. And then we're just gonna save it as a recipe. And for folks who are already familiar with Color Effects Pro 4, you, you've probably done this before. For folks who are brand new to the software, if you wanna save a filter stack um, as a recipe like this, you literally just move to your filter stack on the right side of Color Effects Pro and click Save Recipe. You name the recipe. So I'm gonna name this DT Rust Project. As I click the OK button, uh, the recipes on the left side will pop up. And then if I want this particular recipe or any of the recipes that we've created or downloaded or we're using um, all of the time, if we want to favorite them so that they show up in the Nick Selective tool, you just have to click on the little star that's to the left of the label. Uh, let me click no here. I'm going to click on that little star that highlights the star. Um, and then actually if I, let's say, click on Lomo red, watch what happens here. We're going to get a different filter stack. But as I click on this recipe over here on the left side, we're gonna get a warning saying that adding a recipe is going to replace your filter stack. So now we're not going to have dark and light and center and bleach bypass. We're gonna have whatever is making up the DH Lomo red scale. So let's click yes. Now we have infrared film, film effects and this other stack of filters. Turns out I don't actually want that. Um, so I can do two things. I can just tap command Z on my keyboard and that's gonna bring me back one step or I could go back to the uh, DT Rust project recipe, and that's gonna give us that same recipe. Anyways, it's just a really nice trick. And the beauty of this software is there's, there's different ways of utilizing it based upon your own workflow. And the, the beauty of the new functions of the Nick Selective tool is it opens up new potential workflows that can work even faster for you or just be more convenient for you. So it's a really nice set of features. Um, and, and that's the idea there is to try to optimize the workflow so that you're you're making more pictures as you want to make more pictures. And then you're, uh, the redundant things, the things that slow you down um, in the post-processing can be minimized where the more creative aspects that hopefully folks are probably enjoying more um, can be maximized, those, those sorts of portions of the workflow. All right, so let's go ahead and jump over into Lightroom. And here we're going to talk about uh, two things. The first thing that I wanna tell you about is the new non-destructive post-processing workflow that you can use with the Nick collection in uh, Adobe Lightroom, as well as in Photolab. So uh, I'm gonna show you how to do this from Adobe Lightroom, and we're in Lightroom Classic, by the way, I should, I should mention that. And this is just a really nice way of working because we're able to make adjustments within the collection, save them, and then you know a day later, five minutes later, a year later, whenever we want, we can come back in and we can rework the image without having to start over from scratch. So um, first of all, we would probably wanna make whatever adjustments that you want in the raw processor. In this case, I've actually already gone in and made some minimal adjustments. I wanna convert this photograph to black and white, so we're gonna use Silver Effects Pro. 
Uh, and to do that, to access the NIC plugins here within Lightroom, you just right click on your image and go to the Edit In dialog. When you're in the Edit In dialog, you're going to get uh, your, your different plugins that you've got loaded into Adobe Lightroom. We're going to click on Silver Effects Pro. Um, and then here, I, I want you to get to know this interface. If you haven't already gotten to know how this works as a Lightroom user, um, the Edit a Copy with Lightroom Adjustments is going to be checked on by default, and it's the only option that it, you're going to get if you're dealing with a raw file when, when working with the NIC collection. Because what's happening here is we're taking the raw data and we're duplicating it and creating a TIFF file, or at least in this case, it's a TIFF file. If I click on the twirler, that's to the left of copy files options. Um, th these are the settings that I have currently set up for working within these external editors. Um, and we wanna make sure, that is if we wanna use this new feature, working in a non-destructive process, that we're using a TIFF. So make sure that you're, you're dealing with a TIFF file um, because that's going to give us access to these multi-page TIFF capabilities, which is basically what we're utilizing here. Uh, and then you can choose your color space as you see fit, um, your bit depth and resolution as, as necessary. Anyways, I'm gonna click the twirler, we're gonna click edit, and what's gonna happen is our raw file is gonna be duplicated as a TIFF file, as it normally would be, and then uh, Silver Effects Pro is going to launch. Now, this next little dialogue pops up, and um, what this is telling you, and I would turn this off once you've read this and you understand what's happening. Because I do these webinars like this, I actually leave all of these uh, pop-ups up so that you get a sense of what's gonna happen the first time you use this. But because we're using a TIFF file format, we're going to be able to utilize this little checkbox that's sort of, sort of towards the bottom right of the SilverFX interface. And that's all this is showing us. Once you know what's happening here, where, where this warning comes up, you can actually just click on the Do Not Show Again checkbox and then click the OK button. Again, I'm gonna leave it on uh, simply because as I do these webinars, I, I need to be able to explain those things. Um, long story short, to use this new non-destructive workflow, uh, you wanna make sure that the save and edit later option is on, right? So you can turn that off if you don't wanna use it, if you know for sure that you'll never use that, that's fine, turn it off. But um, we, we have that on by default and uh, that's going to be how you utilize this new process. Now I'm gonna go ahead and maximize Silver Effects Pro. I'm gonna move into our preset library. Let's go to the En Vogue uh, recipes here, or presets. And I wanted to use the more silver, because I like what's happening there. And I'm gonna set a control point. So let's place a control point on her dress, and I'm just gonna darken that down, burn that down just a little bit. So we've got a little bit more detail, a little structure, a little contrast here and there. I wanna direct your eye as the viewer. And the, the beauty of this, process is that these control points will be, um, we, we will be able to re-access them and make changes to them after the fact. So I've set two control points. We'd probably do some more work here or there on this image. I'm going to go ahead and tone the photo and I'm actually going to tone it. Uh, how about like a really heavy uh, copper toner? And then let's go ahead and just add a vignette. And I'm not doing much custom work here um, because I want to show you that if we make a decision and we want to adjust this afterwards, uh, we can do that really easily. So let's say we love this right now. We take a quick look at the before and after. You know, the original image is uh, a, a nice conversion to black and white, but it's a little bit flat. It doesn't direct the viewer very well. Um, you know, the textures within the image are okay. Uh, now we've toned our sort of snapshot travel image, and I'm going to go ahead and click the save photograph. And, um, you know, what you might find here, let's say I wanted to print this and give it to Amanda. Um, I might make these adjustments, print the photograph, and just decide that I don't like the toning, the, the coloring that we've overlaid on this, and maybe I've darkened the edges down too much with the, uh, with the vignette. Well, the, what we can do now is move into our film strip in the bottom portion of our Lightroom interface, right click, make sure you're clicked on the image, obviously, that you want to access the NIC plugins with, click on that, right click, go to Edit In, and then go back down to Silver Effects Pro. As we click on this, um, the reason why I wanted you to kind of get to know this portion of the interface is now we need to open either the original image or we need to edit a copy. In our case, right now, I'm just gonna go ahead and click edit original 
And what's going to happen when I click edit is this TIFF file. So if you follow me down into the bottom portion of the interface, we have our original raw file in the film strip, and then we've got our duplicated TIFF file here. Um, what we're going to do is take that duplicated TIFF file directly into Silver FX, and it should launch with the adjustments on it. And we should be able to go ahead and make these um, adjustments as we see fit. So we get the warning again, tells us that uh, we, you know, we're on a TIFF file and so on and so forth. So I'll click the OK button. Here we've got our image. It's got the toning on it. It's got the control points on it. We can go back in and we can do other processes or re-edit and adjust. And, um, and the, the beauty of this is that now we have a non-destructive process when accessing through uh, the Adobe Lightroom suite. A low, oh, sorry, Adobe Lightroom Classic software. I'm going to open up the shadows here. I went ahead and I changed the toning to a cool toner. Um, I'm also using a shortcut to create new control points. That's Shift-Command-A on a Mac or shift control A on a PC. And that just gives me a really quick way of creating new control points so that we can kind of go back in and re-edit um, and uh, add adjustments or uh, remove them as we see fit. So now let's say we really love what's happening here. We click the save file. And because we still have that checkbox in the lower right corner on, this is still re-editable, right? It's the non-destructive processing. So that updates the image in our Lightroom catalog, and voila, we have our uh, non-destructive process. And that, so, so I, I think I, when I say that, it's kind of understated, but this is a huge jump in workflow processing with with Lightroom uh, in the Nick collection. Uh, because previous to this version, the Nick collection three, you could not do this. Uh, and I'm, I'm just going to leave it there. So. For the next portion of our demonstration, we're going to move into uh, Perspective Effects Pro. And Perspective Effects Pro is a way of controlling um, all sorts of distortion as well as lens corrections and uh, deformation as well, which is different than distortion. But anyways, what I want to show you in, in this image in a series, a couple other photographs as well for the next uh, 10 or 15 minutes is what Perspective Effects Pro is about. And again, as Lori mentioned, I believe it's next Thursday, the 18th, we have another webinar that's all about Perspective Effects Pro, and it will be focusing around architectural photography. So here I just want to show you the some ins and outs. The next webinar, we're going to go right into detail on how it all works and, and what's going on with it. Okay, so here we've got this uh, this evening time landscape or, or architectural photograph sort of of um, a building. I actually purposely photographed it really wide because I knew I would want to fix uh, the the keystoning effect that's occurring here. So um, this was actually with um, an old Nikon 28 millimeter lens it's from the I believe early 90s. Um, and one thing that I want to mention here, notice we're in Lightroom. Obviously, um, I don't have any lens information with this particular lens. And and um, that's going to come into play here. When we move into some of the other photographs that we're using, uh, the, the lens that we used for this image is a more contemporary 24 to 70 lens, and therefore Lightroom recognizes it, and uh, Perspective Effects Pro is going to recognize that as well. But for our first image, I'll show you how you can use these old manual lenses and still uh, correct these kinds of photographs as you see fit. All right. So again, you'd make whatever adjustments that you want to in your raw processor. I'm just going to go ahead and bring the blacks up a little bit in the shadows. Uh, and I'm going to right click on our image, go to edit in as we did when we were working with Silver Effects. And uh, this time we're going to go to perspective effects. So uh, this is a, of course, we want to edit a copy. This is an entirely new, different piece of software for the Nick Suite. So it's an additional um, piece of software that's plugging into Lightroom here and gives us this really wonderful capability uh, that folks may know and love um, in, in the DxO Suite itself. But long story short, here's perspective effects. And uh, right now, if you follow me in the upper right corner, there's no DxO optical module for this because the lens is not a paired lens with the DxO series. And that's because it's a really old Nikon lens that I'm using for this particular photo because I like the old lens. It focuses nicely and it's sharp. So I'm gonna click the okay button right here. 
And that's just telling Perspective Effects Pro that I understand that there aren't auto adjustments because in it, I probably should start with an image that has the auto adjustment because it's kind of the most important thing. This software actually utilizes the DxO Mark modules that partner the camera and the lens combination so that you get the best possible um, fix in any distortion or keystoning or any problems that Perspective Effects is going to fix. I'll show you that on the next few images. For now though, uh, I want to see if my auto perspective button is just going to work for us. Uh, and it basically does, and it should. It will actually work even better uh, if we have the the correct module for the software. But what we're doing here is fixing this perspective. And again, if I actually just turn this off for now, you'll see this keystoning effect. And the auto button is going to do one thing for us. And that is typically going to try to fix the perspective overall in the image. But there are also manual functions built into perspective effects that you're able to draw out different kinds of lines for vertical or horizontals or five or eight point systems. Um, and it just makes for a very powerful, easy to use software, right? In this case, I literally clicked the perspective button and it fixed our perspective for us. Um, now, the next thing that's happening here that you might notice is the EXIF data present in the image didn't allow for the like auto ratio effects to work. And that's, that's because of this older lens, but it doesn't matter. It still fixes the image for us, which to me is amazing. The fact that the software is missing information and yet can still figure out what's going on and fix it for us is pretty incredible. Um, so that's all I wanted to show you with this particular image. We'll talk about some of these other uh, tools in the next few photos. Uh, one quick thing, if we want to look at the before and after, the, a minute ago we did it by um, clicking on this uh, toggle where it just turns off that particular tool. But the way that you'd see before and after if you were adjusting or using multiple tools uh, is by uh, clicking the compare button up here in the upper left corner. So you'll see the before and the after. We're gonna click the save button in the lower right corner. That's gonna bring us back over into our host software, uh, in this case, Adobe Lightroom. And we will have our original raw file with our uh, TIFF file in our film strip, hopefully. Hmm, there we go. There might be a little latency here as well. My computer is actually moving a little bit slow. It's not displaying my my raw file for some reason, uh, but you can see the the final edited image. All right. So let's actually open up a portrait. So the the first thing that I showed you there is how to correct uh, some distortion based upon keystoning because I'm looking up at this giant um, this giant architectural. Uh, feature, this basically the building itself. Uh, in this case, what we're going to do is actually use Perspective Effects Pro to um, add a creative effect and then also use volume deformation, deformation to uh, fix issues with images. Now, um, there, there will be a lot more on this as we move into the more specific webinar, but I figured I should show a portrait and what you can do with this um, very quickly anyways, uh, edit in, we're going to go to perspective effects, edit a copy, the software will launch. It might ask us in this case to actually download an optical module. Yeah, it is. So uh, in the upper right corner, it says a DxO optical module must be downloaded for this image. And, and what we're gonna do here as I click download module is it's gonna tell us the lens and camera combination that we used here. Um, and if I click download, it'll take a few seconds, but it's a very small, just a few kilobyte file. Oh, apparently that one's about five megabytes. Um, and what that is is the uh, combination of the Nikon D800 with this particular lens. And when you downloaded that module, um, it, it is saved somewhere where uh, perspective effects can find it on your computer, in which case you should only have to download that module one time for that camera and lens combination. And therefore, anytime you open up any image into perspective effects, it will apply um, those distortion fixes. In this case, because it's the 24 to 70, I'm gonna click auto here. There isn't gonna be much of a change. It's, and we're shooting at 70, there wasn't much of a uh, distortion that's happening. We're going to go into the volume deformation, and where you're going to see this make the most dramatic effect is when shooting with wide-angle or fisheye lenses, 
where the the sides of the image are, are um, deformed or messed up because of the way light has to come through the optical system and bend or, or shift through those optics to hit the sensor properly. Here, we're shooting with a 70 millimeter lens, so there's not going to be a dramatic change. But even if I click um, on our first option here, you're gonna see it process, and then there should be a, a small shift, maybe not because of the, um, the fact that it's actually fixing it with the main distortion, the sorry, the photo module. Um, but we're able to go in and, and manually adjust the edges and the shape as necessary. So uh, this can be really helpful in a headshot like this, uh, both for fixing any issues because of the optics, as well as if you need to maybe shift the, the shape of the face of your subject um, some ways. You can go ahead and do that vertically and horizontally with this option or with the diagonal option, which I don't think fits in this case. Um, but if we drag this down to 100, you'll actually see a, a minor shift in this deformation. Now, again, where you're going to see the most dramatic effect with this feature is with the wider angle lenses. But I thought it was an, oops, I didn't mean to do that. I thought it was an interesting feature and tool to show. And it's something that I'm really interested in with my headshot stuff um, so that I can adjust the shape of the face utilizing a, an optical based system. All right, so let's, let's scroll down here. And what I wanna do is actually use this miniature effect uh, to create a blur to direct your eye as the viewer in towards our subject's face. Now, the, the idea behind this, and of course, as creatives, you can use this any way you see fit. But the general idea of this miniature effect is to kind of emulate what you can do with tilt shift lenses um, to create a kind of miniature blurred effect around the edges, right? Uh, I'll show you that as well. But one of the things that's really pretty cool to do with portraits is if you turn this feature on uh, and we rotate this to maybe just fit around his eyes, so this is an on-image control, which we're able to rotate. We're able to turn the blur up or down. Let's, we can increase it, so there's quite a bit of blur. I've enlarged my cursor for the webinar, and it kind of messes with me a little bit because it's harder to click around. Hopefully, it's easier for you to see the cursor, though. So uh, we can turn the blur up or down. Right now, this is the blur amount is set to be symmetrical, so we're getting the exact same amount on the left and right side. If you actually follow me to the lower right corner, we can turn those features off. So, so the symmetric position and the symmetric blur, we can turn those on and off. So I can actually blur the left side more than the right side. So right now it's set to 97. Let's bring this down to, uh, let's say 50, and then we'll bring this down to maybe 80. So now we have a different amount of blur on the left compared to the right. Um, and then of course you can mess around with uh, the, the different number of blades that this feature is emulating optically. With that, let's just take a quick before and after. Oops, I need to click the apply button here, so I apply the adjustment. And then I'm gonna move into the upper left corner and you can see the original image and then the enhanced image where we've um, corrected optically and then we've turned on the deformation uh, adjustments and our mini miniature effect as well. So we're using this for both creative as well as corrective processes. I'm gonna click the save button in the lower right corner. That's gonna bring us back over into uh, our Lightroom interface. And I'm just gonna open up one more picture uh, before we sort of transition into our Q&A. So the, the last image I wanna show you is just a, a, a nice sort of aerial photograph or an image that's shot from the top of a roof, it looks like. It looks like maybe there's a roof here. I didn't shoot this one, uh, this was provided to me. And um, it's a really, that miniature effect can create this really cool direction and uh, aesthetic feel to the photograph to make it seem as though this is miniature as opposed to you know, the actual size standing on the side of a building taking a picture or shooting with drone photographs, uh, which would be a really cool way of applying this if, you, if you've got a, a UAV that you can utilize for this kind of photography. Okay, right click on your image, edit in, uh, perspective effects, edit a copy, and we didn't make any adjustments with um, with Lightroom this time. Note that edit a copy and edit original are both uh, kind of ready to go. They're not grayed out like they were before. And that's because in this case, um, the image isn't a raw file. 
it's a JPEG right now. And so I wanted to point that out because it is a different kind of file and that's why we're getting these other options. Right now for our demo, it doesn't matter what we use. Um, so I'm just gonna go ahead and click edit and it will still duplicate our image. Um, but I feel like I should you know, kind of point that stuff out. All right, so let's just scroll right to the bottom. Let's turn our mini miniature effect on. And voila, I mean, right away, it, it creates this really beautiful, interesting feel. It looks like we're looking at a train set or something like that. Uh, and what we're going to do is just rotate this around so aesthetically we've got it where, how we want it to be. If you click on your center point, you can actually move the center point, put it anywhere you want. Uh, there, Again, there are many features and options. We've got the symmetrical positioning on right now. And I guess just to explain this for a minute or so, your center column here that you see is is going to be sharp or is going to be the um, the inherent sharpness or um, in focused area that you had in your image. And then as you move into the, the first lines here, there's actually going to be a gradient from the part that's, if you will, in focus to the out of focus or the blurred application. And then once you get outside of the dotted lines, you will have the, the sort of full blur um, that, that you're applying to your areas uh, applied to it. And again, as you click on your, your on image controls, you can control each aspect of that. So right now my blur is at 40, I'll turn that down to nine, or maybe turn the left up to um, 100. We'll turn the symmetric blur off, and then we'll tur turn the right um, blur down to maybe 50 or something like that. There we go, 30. Just so you can get a sense of, of how this is working. Uh, really nice feature. Really beautiful effect. I think this is still too strong. I'm not going to leave that up at 100. It just kind of bothers me. Um, and as I bring this down, it will reprocess, it will reapply, and voila, we have our miniature effect. We click the apply button. We could go into these other features as well and, and adjust them as we see fit, but I really just wanted to open this one up to show you that miniature effect um, with, with a couple different thought processes or kinds of images in mind. So I'll click the save button. That's again going to bring us back over into our host software, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and call that one, Lori. So that's that's the end of sort of the presentation portion of the webinar. Do we have any questions? Yeah, actually, several people wanted to see in Photoshop how if they can't find that selective tool, where mm -hmm. to find it. And I've noticed, by the way, folks, that um, when you first install the new upgrade. It might be minimized in the lower left corner, but Dan, can you show them where automate file automate where you can absolutely access? that'd be great. Yep. So, and I'll I'll show you a couple of things. I'll show you that first, and then I'll talk to you about the settings in there as well. So, I'm going to close the Nick Selective tool, um, figuring that that's how you're you're opening your software. It pops up like this. There's no Nick Selective tool. To access the Nick Selective tool, you go up to the File drop-down menu, very top left there. Uh, go to Automate and then you click on the Nick Selective Tool 2. As you click on that, it will pop up. Now, the next time you open up Photoshop, you're gonna have to do that again, unless you move into the settings in the Nick Selective Tool, and um, you have it in the general section. It says, open Nick Selective Tool automatically. Right now, if yours is not opening, this checkbox isn't on, so you just go ahead and check that back on, and then you can click the OK button. And then when you launch Photoshop, your Nick Selective tool is going to open as well. Let's see here. Somebody um, was asking if you can make a second miniature effect on one image. Um, is that possible? Maybe, hmm. You may have to save if, it back out and come back in. Yeah, I think that's what you'd need to do. So, so here we've got our original photograph right, that we just made that miniature effect on. Here we've applied the miniature effect, and then what we could do is actually go back in. So we'd save it, and then you'd have to go back into Perspective Effects Pro and apply a different uh, miniature effect to the same image, if you want to apply it twice. There's no way that I know of um, where you're able to apply it two times in, you know, the one visit of the software, if you will. Okay. But here, I'll just go ahead and we'll just do that really quickly. But the thing is, is now we're kind of blurring on top of blur, which would be fine. And it's going it, to, it would definitely create a different aesthetic for us. Um, I think if, if we were to do that, I would, I would be a little less heavy handed on the first application um, and then maybe go a little bit more on this one. But it's, that's, that's a subjective choice, obviously. I'll click apply, click save, and now we'll have done it twice. 
just to see the difference here. Oop, there we go. So um, I believe this one on the right is the original, and then we've got our double blur on the left. Cool. Okay. Any more there, Louis? Yeah, there's um, mainly it's the perspective effects. I think because this is a brand new program, <clears throat> excuse me, Absolutely. people have a lot of questions about it. So, folks, if you can join us on that Thursday, that'd be great. If you can't, we will be recording it so that you can view it later as well. But uh, Dan will go into more detail for sure. And uh, yeah, we'll, and we're going to go through every single feature in the software as well yeah. while we're in there. Yeah. yeah, so we'll be able to answer questions there. Um, there's uh, questions about support for affinity, and there is a hmm, let's see here. I'm going to grab a link to a release note since people are asking quite a bit about this. And this has the system requirements and some of the new updates uh, that are within the NIC Collection 3. So I'm putting that into the chat box, folks, so you can take a look at that. And um, because there were people asking about system requirements mm -hmm. as well. Okay, let's see here. I'm going to try to find one more for you. That's <laughs> not perspective effects right now. Um, and I don't mind answering some questions here or there if possible. Uh, we, it's just we will probably will in the yeah. perspective effects specific webinar, you know, just answer all the questions in the demonstration itself. Yeah, and there were questions about differences between perspective effects and viewpoint, for instance. Um, that might be got it. Well, go over. And yeah. yeah, we will we will talk in we will talk through those differences as well. Right now, as a quick answer, uh, the way that that I know of the differences, or the, let me reword that, the the way that it's been described to me is that uh, th those viewpoint and uh, perspective effects pro are like two, you know, they're like twin brothers, if you will. Right now, they're very similar in their capability, but because they exist in different spaces and they will be utilized likely by different folks, um, they they will move forward and grow up, if you will, and they will move in their own direction. So right now, those two pieces of software are very similar. They're based on the same technology, um, but one you know is for built into the NIC collection, and the other is a plugin for PhotoLab. Uh, and it's own standalone, obviously, as well. Great. Hopefully that, yeah, helps. Okay, folks, we do appreciate you joining us. Dan, thank you again. Absolutely, and, uh, my pleasure. Please join us for another webinar. Thanks, folks. Have a Thanks, good day. everyone. <laughs> Bye. Bye.